Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Desiree Bryant, RPA's Director of Meetings. Thank you for joining our webinar on delivering care via telehealth to kidney patients during COVID-19. Before we begin, I would just like to say how much you all are appreciated. I'm sure it's not easy being on the front lines of a health crisis, so thank you. A few housekeeping notes for you. And while I'm going over the housekeeping notes, I would like to know how many of you currently engage in telehealth. So you're gonna see a poll pop up on your screen. And if you could take that poll for us and let us know, that'd be great. So here are a few housekeeping notes. All lines will be in listen mode only during the webinar. There will be a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. You may submit your questions at any time using the Q&A feature at the top of your screen. You should see a question mark icon. Please do not submit questions in the chat because those won't be captured or answered. Please use the Q&A. There will also be a series of feedback emojis. So we'd like to know what you're thinking. So feel free to use those as well. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on RPA's e-learning platform and the COVID-19 hub on RPA's website. The slides will also be available after the webinar. Now, we'll also have a evaluation that we'll be sending to you as soon as the webinar is over. So we would really appreciate you guys filling that out for us. This webinar is supported by Dallas Healthcare. So thank you for your support. We really do appreciate it. Now I would like to introduce your presenters for today. We are fortunate to have Dr. Kathy, Catherine Kwan and Robert Blazer. Dr. Kwan is a partner at Lake Michigan Nephrology in South Joseph, Michigan, and currently uses telehealth with her patients. And Robert Blazer, many of you know, as RPA's Director of Public Policy and has done a tremendous job gathering and sorting through all the things telehealth. Their full bios are on the screen, so take a look at those, and they're also included in the presentation. And again, thank you for joining us, and now I will turn it over to Rob Blazer. Rob? Thank you, Desiree. Um, I'm trying to advance the slides here, Steve. Um, but, um, oh, there we go. Thank you. And I are we having our first, there we go. We're going to have our first poll question, so I'll go ahead and advance that. Oh, sorry. Steve, are, are we done with the poll? I'm sorry. I know that we're off to an auspicious start here. I'm going to go ahead and proceed with the presentation. Here we go. So anyway, the issues we're going to talk about are telehealth policy, what, what, what was going on before COVID, what's happened recently, and other relevant points that I think the group needs to know. And then Dr. Kwan's going to talk about her experience doing this um, in her practice in Michigan. I think that's going to be really instructive for folks. So moving on to the next slide. Um, I put this up here. You know, this is kind of old news. I'm going to go over this swiftly but I thought it was useful for people to, um, to be able to see what CMS was doing before COVID. So you see all those codes there, outpatient E&M, most of the dialysis codes, kidney disease education, transitional care management, advanced care planning. And that's all great. All these codes were on the list, uh, on, you know, approved to be done via telehealth and everyone would celebrate in Washington when they got some of their codes on the list. But the fact of the matter was that uh, the originating site and the geographic restrictions prevented people from using them a lot. Um, the originating sites included, excluded the patient's home and the dialysis facility, so that was not good for us. But the real big thing was the fact that the geographic restrictions um, limited the use to primarily rural areas as defined by CMS. So um, anyway, and the other thing is, is that there were HIPAA concerns. I never found the HIPAA concerns to be that big of a deal, only because I never heard about people getting in trouble for not using HIPAA compliant information. Maybe it's because I wasn't paying attention enough to that space, but anyway, that's, that's, that's you know, my, my understanding was that was not a problem. So moving on to the next slide, in terms of recent revisions, on March 6, Congress passed uh, the first one of their stimulus bills, and this allowed CMS, gave CMS the discretion to lift, lift the originating site and geographic restrictions, and they did this on March 17. So now all codes on the telehealth list can be provided from any distance site 
Um, and the distance site is where the doctor or the physician or the doctor or the nurse practitioner or the PA is located to any originating site, which is where the patient is. So uh, as such, face-to-face -face interactions are no longer required for all of these codes, and these do include the MCP and the MCP complete assessments. And this was affirmed on, on Monday, on March 30th, CMS put out an interim final rule where they, um, where they said that this was, um, uh, they, they, they could be covered or provided that way. You know, there had been some gray area here, partially because the single visit codes weren't originally on the approved telehealth list, and also the fact that the um, original telehealth only ap applied to the uh, multiple visit codes, but that has been resolved. So additionally, CMS allows the use of virtually all real-time, non-public-facing audio vid video technology, so things like iP iPhone, Skype, and FaceTime, but you can't use public facing technology like Facebook Live or TikTok or Twitch. Not that I even know what those are. But anyway, so, um, so anything that works in real time where you can see and hear the person on the other end can be used. And they also lifted the restrictions. And this was a big deal that I got a lot of questions about. They lifted the restrictions on new patients being seen by telehealth. So it's not just established patients anymore. It is new patients as well. Moving on to the next slide, hopefully. Oh, Steve, uh, we're, we're going to do a poll now. Okay, so you saw the numbers there. It looks like uh, we're approaching somewhere between um, somewhere between uh, 85 and 90 percent of people are saying that the um, that they will be using telehealth either very strongly or somewhat strongly. So we're moving on to recent revisions here, and the first, and this is something that came out Monday night, is that <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, claims should use the place of service that would have been used if the encounter happened face to face. And um, this, was, this is different from what they used to say, which was you should use place of service 02 uh, for telehealth. Now they're doing it wherever it would have happened um, if telehealth wasn't being used and it was face-to-face. -face. Additionally, you should use moder uh, modifier 95 as of March 30th. And the reason that CMS did this is because they're trying to make payment as equitable as possible as if the, um, if the services had been provided face-to-face. -face. This is absolutely to their credit. They're doing the right thing. This is recalling that telehealth claims before would be paid at the facility rate versus the non-facility rate. And for a lot of these E&M codes and dialysis codes and whatever, that rate might be lower. So CMS deserves a lot of credit for doing that. That's great news. Um, now, in terms of um, reimbursement, uh, the reimbursement will be the same, and the documentation requirements are the same as well. You should document uh, telehealth claims the same way you would if they were face-to-face. -face. If there's some aspect of the encounter that you can't document because it's happening by, um, by telehealth, you should just document as to why you couldn't do that and put that in the record. And it's also probably a good idea just to put in the fact that the encounter happened by telehealth as well. Although, you know, that's something that's in your documentation. They're going to know from the claim, of course, because you use the place of service um, that you should have used in modifier 95. So all of these, uh, first, 
everything it's applicable to all patients so it's not just covid patients that's a point they made in one of their faqs policy revisions are apl applicable until the conclusion of the public health emergency and that's something that cms is going to decide so you know that presumably sometime later this year early next year whenever the public health emergency is over and then in terms of um the office of inspector general and auditing and enforcement cms has been saying pretty much all along ever since uh, the, this situation began a couple of weeks ago, that they're going to be telling their enforcement people to exercise discretion, kind of give providers a wide berth. And similarly, the, uh, the OIG won't be doing administrative sanctions for waiving uh, patient cost-sharing obligations. It's interesting that they use the phrase good faith a lot in their, um, in their language, saying if, you know, essentially um, indicating that if providers are using good faith in providing their uh, services and not trying to take advantage one way or another that they um that that they're going to respond that way and not and not hold people accountable for when they're trying to do the right thing so moving on to the next slide here we go okay so uh recent revisions continued in other notes so now the single visit in center dialysis codes and you see the code numbers there the first two are for pediatric codes and the third one's for adults are now allowable via telehealth as of March 30th. Um, there was language in the rule where they listed all of the outpatient dialysis codes and they have a prologue in there that gives an explanation um, as to why they're doing it. And they're saying they recognize that there are a lot of times where it really is good to be face-to-face, -face, but in the current uh, public health emergency, um that they recognize that to maintain patient safety maintain provider safety it's not advisable and there there's a prologue of all the lists they're adding to the you know the telehealth list and they had and they add all of the outpatient dialysis codes there so um the one other big thing that they did on monday is the cpt codes for telephone e and m services so these are cpt codes 99441 through 443 now have a covered status in the fee schedule as of March 30th. And this is something that RPA kind of led the charge on because we were here, and in fact, Dr. Kwan is one of the first people who pointed this out to us three weeks ago, that you should be able to pay for this. And I went and checked the status of those services and they were not covered. So we led the charge on getting CMS to make them, um, to make them covered. So um, um, the, uh, the, I want to point out and talk for a second about the difference between telephone services and telehealth services. To CMS, telehealth refers to real-time, interactive, audio-visual, where both parties can see and hear each other. That's not telephone. So that list of services, the E&M codes, the dialysis codes, transitional care management, all that, um, none, of that um, is, uh, none of that can be done by telephone. Um, it has to be done by tele, uh, that's telehealth. So the telephone services are those CPT codes right there. Now, um, they pay, they don't pay a ton of money. It's about, uh, 15 bucks for a five minute, five to 10 minute conversation, uh, about 28 bucks for a, a 10 to 20 minute conversation and about 40 bucks if you get north of 21 minutes. But if you can't make the AV piece happen, um, they that you re, you can get reimbursed something for that, and one other one other note that I want to point out here is that I've gotten a lot of uh, inquiries about acute kidney injury codes, and CMS has not addressed that yet. So it cannot, as of today, be provided by telehealth. I have uh, communicated with the administration, and they've gotten back to me saying that that is a good idea. That the um, uh, that a, uh, acute kidney injury services should be provided via telehealth. And we're also working with a couple of the coalitions we work with to make that happen. So we're hopeful that AKI will be, happen in the next round of regulatory revisions, but for right, not for right now. And then one other point, uh, some health systems and insurers might not be considered vascular access services to enable dialysis and PD catheter placement as essential procedures. CMS uh, higher-ups have pledged to address this. Um, I, uh, unofficially, they're telling us that not to worry about it, but they haven't put out paper about that quite yet. So um, I'm trying to, uh, let's see, move on to the next slide. Okay, so other notes. 
and this is something that, that I got asked uh, I got asked about pretty early on. Distance site practitioners can work from anywhere, including home. For so, for example, if the practitioner, the physician, MPPA, or whoever is quarantined themselves, they can do um, they can do telehealth from their home. You know, presuming they've got the real time audio video, they can do it from there. So that's that's um, that's one point. The other is that there are limits on uh, state licensure for healthcare professionals. They've been temporarily waived. So if you're in, uh, say, a, 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 a practitioner in Virginia and you're seeing a patient in West Virginia, you can still do that by telehealth and you don't have to worry about state licensure. CMS put out a list of waivers, what they call 1135 waivers. This came out a couple weeks ago, and both of these points were made um, in the waiver list. They've also lifted the restrictions on patient cost sharing obligations and they've eased the requirements on patient consent. You just have to get patient consent one time and it can happen at the time of the interaction. So if you're having a telehealth interaction with one of your patients, you can, um, you, you can just ask them for their consent in that space. And then in terms of um, uh, uh, quality measures, in, uh, MIPS and the Medicare secondary, um, secondary payer uh, or excuse me, Medicare Shared Savings Programs for ACOs, the 2019 reporting deadline was extended to April 30th. Um, MIPS, MIPS clinicians not reporting will receive a neutral payment adjustment for 2021, and, and CMS is still trying to figure out what they're going to do. Um, then that's for payment year 2021, and they're still trying to figure out what they're going to do for relief from 2021 participation. So, uh, more to come on that, and we'll be in touch on all of all of these issues. And with that, I believe I turn it over to uh, Dr. Kwan. Okay, we're going to do a poll first, and then we'll be turning it over to Dr. Kwan. Hi, everyone. I wanted to start by just understanding what kind of practice you're in, as I can give you some ideas about how we approach telehealth for our two-person practice. I want to make sure I'm covering the broad range of practices, but it looks like a lot of the participants are in sort of the same deal that I am. We will give people another minute or so to answer, and then I'll go into how we got telehealth up and running. Small, I would say, let's call it like five practitioners or less. Um, this is not particularly scientific. All right. Thanks very much. I'm going to move on. Okay, so time is a little bit difficult to keep track of, but we closed our clinic to in-person visits uh, three weeks ago, out of concern that we had COVID spreading in our community, wanting to keep um, our practitioners, our staff, and our patients safe. Um, we did not have any telehealth abilities uh, prior to this, and so we needed to quickly implement a way to get up and running. Um, the considerations when I was looking for things was one, we were a little bit worried about bandwidth. And so initially we envisioned coming in to provide telehealth services within our office, um, you know, before they uh, made it clear that you could provide it in the home. And our computers did not have cameras or microphones. Um, so one option when you're looking to get up and running quickly are commercial telehealth vendors. There are a couple out there like DoxyMe, uh, VC, a couple others. Um, they have some pros and cons that we looked at. Um, the pros for the commercial telehealth vendors is especially if you're going for their bare bones version um, where they're not waiting to integrate directly with your electronic medical record, um, you can download uh, a website, cloud-based website, and get going pretty quickly. Um, and the staff need a little bit of training, but not a lot. Uh, I think a big plus to those programs is that they're already HIPAA compliant uh, after the COVID emergency ends. Um, I think that telehealth in some form or fashion is going to be here to stay. Patients love the convenience of it. Um, so if you're going to invest time right now in getting a platform up and running, there is an advantage to working with a program that lets you, uh, lets you, um, sorry, uh, lets you move forward after the emergency when we might not be able to use things like FaceTime and Skype. 
Um, the other thing about the commercial vendors is that their video programs are often need less bandwidth than something that's done over the patient's mobile phones, um, or they can use 3G. So I'm in a rural area and a lot of my patients have difficulty um, accessing something like FaceTime because they don't have enough uh, data. Um, the cons to the um, commercial telehealth vendors, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to navigate. And on the patient side, since you're coaching them through remotely how to do it, uh, if they have to install an app or navigate to a website, um, especially for seniors, that can be challenging. And one thing we really wanted to avoid was encouraging our seniors to have their, their grandkids or their kids come over and sort of break their isolation to help them with their technology. Uh, the other thing is that it's a change to your own workflow. And I don't know about you all, but I'm kind of cognitively burnt out at the moment. I really can't take on learning a whole lot of new stuff. Uh, this is enough that I'm already dealing with. So I wanted something minimally disruptive. But uh, if you feel like you can work with a new website, um, these are this is a nice option. They're not very expensive. Um, we ultimately, because of the lack of hardware in our clinic, we didn't have cameras, we didn't have microphones, we decided not to do this one. Um, so the other thing um, that on March 17th was allowed was that um, CMS said that existing platforms that had previously not been considered HIPAA compliant could be used. So for iPhones, that's FaceTime. Um, there's also Skype, there's Google Duo. So those work on your existing smartphone. Um, and it's, it's a little bit more like a phone call. So Google Duo comes up with a keypad and you type in a phone number. FaceTime is integrated into the iPhone calling screen. Uh, so for seniors, especially who are not particularly savvy, uh, that's very easy for them to use. Um, and again, there's minimal new software to learn. So this, this really is very easy to integrate. If you know how to place a phone call, you can pretty much figure out how to use this. Um, the cons, clinicians are gonna require a new phone or they're gonna have to use their own. And there's no way to use something like the Doximity Dialer app with um, FaceTime or Google Duo so your phone number becomes visible and that can affect your privacy. Uh, and then bandwidth and connectivity are um, a, a difficulty if you're in an area where your cell phone signal drops out, you're also presumably using your cloud-based EMR. Uh, so there winds up being quite a bit of bandwidth being used. You don't wanna be in the middle of a patient visit uh, and drop your signal or drop your call. But you know best the, uh, the cell phone signal penetration in your area. So after evaluating our options relatively quickly, this is the one that myself and my partner decided to go with. And I wanna walk you through how we did that. Um, so we decided that we were gonna use existing video chat options, which had not been previously allowed, but under the waiver, we don't have to worry about the HIPAA compliance issue. Um, I purchased two iPhone 6s. Um, you don't need the latest and greatest. Uh, an iPhone 6 is pretty inexpensive. Um, I didn't want a long-term contract, so I went by one of the um, contract-free carriers. There's Cricket Wireless, there's Boost Mobile. I got an unlimited data plan because FaceTime especially is a real data hog um, and signed up to have new phone numbers. Um, and those I could purchase online and they were delivered within a couple of days. I got two small tripods and two Bluetooth headpieces. Um, uh, off of Amazon, and the total cost, cost for all of this was $520, uh, and then month to month, I'll have about a $60 charge for a data plan. Um, if you're pursuing this route, you'll have an option for Android or iPhones. Our experience has been that a lot of seniors who have smartphones have iPhones. Um, FaceTime's very intuitive. Um, I think seniors are purchasing phones that are easy to use. Um, and again, you do not need the latest and greatest iPhone model. Um, so an iPhone 6 is readily available and pretty inexpensive. And the advantage of having um, a new phone number is that I'm not compromising my own phone number's privacy. So how does this look like in our day-to-day -day office workflow? Um, we have decided to send all of our staff home um, except for one a day. Uh, they all remain on full pay, by the way. I think that's really important. I've got great staff. 
Um, so there's one staff member in the office to answer the office phones, deal with um, refills, uh, and also set up your schedule for the day ahead. We call the patients several days in advance. And as we've learned this, we've generated a script um, that is shared between st staff members. So they know exactly how to coach people through this. So a written script that is updated each day is very, very helpful. Um, it's important to identify as I'm going through my clinic schedule, anybody with a smartphone, anybody with an iPad or a tablet. Um, FaceTime, it's, I did not know this until now, FaceTime is only available between Apple products. Um, for people who have Android products, um, we found that Skype was very confusing for people to, to initiate, especially if you're coaching somebody through it on the phone. Skype is a download, and then you have to create a login. Um, and we have shifted on the Android platform to Google Duo, which is a lot easier, more intuitive. It works like the FaceTime dialer. So my clinic staff are able to walk <clears throat> even uh, senior folks through um, downloading Google Duo. During that initial phone call that happens a couple days earlier, they also obtain and document the consent for the telehealth visit. They give them the phone number that we're going to be using to call them um, because it's going to be a number that looks un unfamiliar to them so that they know to expect that call. Um, and we also tell them up front that this is a phone that we're strictly using to place the audio video calls, not to text it, not to call it, not to treat it like an office number. And I will say 99% of our patients have respected that. And the phones that we're using for audiovisual telehealth have not received texts or calls. Um, the staff also reminds them to have their medications ready so that we can do a medication check over the phone and recent home blood pressures handy. Um, we've had a couple of patients who don't have a home blood pressure cuff, um, but they want one. They're scared to go out and they don't know how to do online shopping. So we will order them a blood pressure cuff through our Amazon business account and have it delivered to their home. And we just bill them for the cost of the cuff. Um, so that we're really trying to optimize uh, how we can take care of our patients and get the best information possible. Um, the staff on my clinic schedule, and we use Epic uh, for our electronic medical record, um, will indicate on the waiting room or the schedule what kind of program I'm going to use for each visit, whether it's going to be FaceTime or Google Duo, and what phone number I should be calling. So then I pull up my clinic schedule at home, and I can go down the clinic list one at a time, placing the calls using the appropriate platform. Patients who don't have video capabilities, and I will say that's a fair number of them, are offered a brief phone check-in, but I think it's important to set that sort of expectation that it, it's not as full service a video. And then um, we closed our clinic, so we are now able to work from home. I've got my new little iPhone on a tripod, and I use a Bluetooth headset, and I'm in my lovely little home office that I've just created, uh, and this is where I take a uh, clinic. And the patients are told the time that I will call, and it just works with my regular clinic schedule. So there are a lot of pitfalls that we learned in the first week. Um, how your staff offers the telehealth visits to the patients is critical, and we've learned a lot about the language that needs to be used. So we were initially asking people, do you have a smartphone? Um, and smartphone sounds really intimidating, especially to a lot of the seniors. They don't know what it means. Um, and their default is just, no, 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 I don't have a smartphone. So what you have to do is ask them, can you check Facebook on your phone? Can you check email on your phone? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, then you've got a smartphone. If it doesn't flip open, it's got a screen, it's probably a smartphone. Um, and then we've also learned that a lot of people have said, oh, yeah, I've got an iPhone. And it turns out that everybody's using iPhone as just a vernacular for a smartphone. Um, and you'll find that out when you go to place a FaceTime call and that number is not available for FaceTime. So once you've confirmed that they do have a screen on their phone and it can check email and such, have them flip it over and look at the logo. Have them tell you who makes the phone. And if it's not an Apple, then they're going to need to download Google Duo and you can walk them through that. So FaceTime only works for iPhones. 
Um, and that's why you need to be making these calls several days in advance and just be really patient and encouraging. These conversations are going to take 10 minutes or so. This is really a significant chunk of my staff's day-to-day -day time right now. Um, don't have them any time pressure. Don't try to be doing the download, you know, 15 minutes before their appointment. Uh, some patients need a couple calls back. Some of them want to talk to their kids on the phone to have them walk it through it. So really try and give them a day or two lag time to get this set up. So the practice um, revenue, uh, the impact, if you cannot get the audio visual um, going, which is still required for telehealth, um, it's kind of severe. So if you're doing a telehealth, I usually bill a level four since I'm a nephrologist and my patients tend to be complicated. Um, telehealth or face-to-face, -face, reimbursement's around $105. If you're just doing a phone check-in, which is what we were doing the first week, that's $15. And now we have these telephone-only codes that Rob was talking about, 99441, 2, and 3, that are time-based. Um, but you can spend up to 22 minutes and you're only going to get reimbursed $41. So you really have to emphasize to your staff um, to, to hunt down those people with uh, smartphones. And as, if they've got the capability, really encourage them to take part in the televideo visit, which allows you to bill your regular level forward visit. In our first week of doing this, we only had 20% of patients um, who said that they were able to do an audiovisual call. And so we were doing a lot of phone call visits. Uh, as we got more thorough, as we developed our written script and coached people through how to identify what kind of phone they had and how to download the apps, we got up to about 50%. But the impact on practice revenue remains pretty severe. Also, even when I had patients that were signed up for a Google Duo or a FaceTime visit, uh, when it was time to place the call, it became apparent that they just didn't have enough bandwidth. Uh, they were there, they could answer a regular audio call, uh, but the, the FaceTime or the Google Duo would not go through. And I suspect it's because they didn't have enough bandwidth. So you are going to lose some of those visits and have to convert them on the fly to the 99441, 42, and 43. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I want to talk for the last few minutes about another option to provide excellent care for your patients uh, over the phone without a video component that is um, pays significantly more than the new 99441, 2, and 3 codes. So I'd like to start with a poll. Um, and let's see. Uh, it's called prime, or it's actually called principal care management rather than primary care management. So not primary care, but have you been providing principal care management services? And I'll give people a couple of minutes to answer. Principal care management used to be called chronic care management. Uh, it is designed for patients who have a significant health concern that is longer lasting than three months. So stage four and stage five kidney disease really fits into that. It's a covered Medicare service. Um, again, it was chronic care management up until January 1st, 2020. They changed the requirements um, to try and encourage more specialists to provide this. Um, and they also uh, made the uh, regulatory burdens a little bit less and up the reimbursement significantly. So it's looking like maybe a quarter of you have been providing this, and I think that's great. This has actually been a, a revenue base that um, our practice has grown significantly um, just in the last couple of weeks as we recognize that a lot of our patients, despite our best efforts, don't have access to the full audiovisual telehealth. So principal care management is billed under a service code of G2064. And I encourage you to, um, to Google it and learn about it. We'll try and um, walk you through a little bit. But it's a covered Medicare benefit for patients with a severe chronic problem. We've been doing chronic care management for the last several years for our stage four and five patients. So um, it's monthly coordination of care between an RN 
Uh, and so you are coordinating care among the rest of the patient's doctors and also coordinating with the patient. That usually is done with a monthly phone call. It does not require a video component. Um, I will say that this is probably not a program that you can get up and running in a week. Um, you do need to sort of understand what goes into the care plan. Um, and you need to put in 30 minutes of work per patient per month, but it can be done in a cumulative fashion and it doesn't have to all be scheduled. So my nurse practitioner who does our principal care management, um, when she is done with hospital rounds is able to jump on and into patient's charts and start doing this work. Um, we place a phone call to the patient. And again, the advantage is it can just be over the telephone and it pays $85 per person per month it can only be billed by one provider per patient per month, and it can't be billed in the same month as a transitional care management visit. Again, we've been doing this as chronic care management for a couple of years. Patients love this. They love getting that monthly phone call. They love that all of their doctors are working together. We've had a number of saves where we've uh, headed off inappropriate medications or tests or procedures. Um, so this is actually a significant value to your patients. It's a lot easier to do if you share an EMR with most of the other doctors in the community. It makes that required coordination of care a lot easier to do. Um, this isn't meant to be a whole webinar on principal care management, but I think the bottom line is that we're all going to take a pretty significant revenue hit despite our best efforts at getting up and going on telehealth. And so as nephrologists with a lot of stage four and stage five patients, this is a way to keep a close eye on your patients during this health emergency when they can't be coming in for clinic visits as often. Um, it's, a, it's a benefit that the patients really enjoy uh, and it is more remunerative than just the little phone check-ins. So I wanted to encourage that because that's been a saving grace for our practice. So you can do this. You can get up and running on telehealth. Um, CMS and HHS, they've provided a lot of relief from restrictions that I think we're all recognizing were pretty uh, onerous before all this started. Um, RPA continues to be a great advocate in seeking clarification on what can and can't be done and can and can't be covered. Um, if you're nimble and you're in a small practice, um, again, you could use the existing web-based programs, or you can just go straight to the standalone video, such as FaceTime or Google Duo, and get going relatively quickly. Uh, having said that, we are in an emergency. Everybody's hurting. Uh, office workflows and your revenue are going to be adversely affected. I think there's not much escape around that. Um, and continuing to partner with RPA is an ongoing resource, um, as we're doing today, and I'm happy to be a part of. I'm going to ask Darcy to jump on and talk about the COVID-19 hub or else, uh, Rob. Uh, sure. Uh, can, can folks hear me? Can you hear me, Katie? I can hear you. I can't see you. Okay. I'm, I'm fixing that right now. Um, so we developed this COVID-19 hub about uh, 10 days ago. There's all kinds of resources there. And I've been seeing, um, I've been seeing previews of some of the questions if people could, uh, could, could see the lists of codes that are out there that are coverable by, uh, by telehealth. Uh, one of the first documents you'll see on this hub is the guidance that we've generated and updated since all of this happened. We sent out one version of it on March 17th uh, that captured the first round of changes and we updated it on Tuesday of this week, the 31st. So that accounts for everything that was in this interim final rule. The lists of codes are there, so let that be printed out, have it as a resource. Um, for what it's worth, CMS added a bunch of um, other codes, <clears throat> excuse me, to the list, not just the dialysis codes, but like emergency room E&M codes, that kind of thing. So I would urge people to go look at that and see the codes that got added. There might be a bunch, you know, other codes that would, you would use in the course of your practice that are going to be available to you. And with, uh, let's see, do we, we have another, yeah, okay, don't want to leave out the other slides here, but the COVID hub is great. Um, I will never encourage anyone to ever get on Twitter. However, if you're there already, um, uh, Katie is a dynamite follow. Um, I'm less dynamite, and all of you should be following RPA Nephrology as well. And um, there's, there's a question email at the bottom, rpa uh, at renalmd.org. You can submit all your questions there. 
And I, let's see, I think we have, a, okay, and just want to um, uh, acknowledge our sponsor again, um, Isolus. Uh, we appreciate the fact that they're uh, helping us do this. So um, that's Dynamite. That is the last slide. So uh, what I'm going to do is slide on up to the questions box. Um, we, we're getting an ocean of questions, as you might well imagine. So I'm going to do my best to, to triage these, Katie, and um, when I think it's one that might be more appropriate for you, I'll pass it along. Although these do seem like a lot of policy questions. So um, uh, the first two are pretty similar about uh, can the doctor speak on the phone with no video and still build telehealth? And the answer is technically no, you cannot do that. Now, you know, I've talked to nephrologists who have said, uh, I'm going to do an MCV visit, you know, the, it's particularly the non-complete assessments by phone and document it in my record. Uh, you know what, if you're gonna do that, CMS has already said that they are gonna be relaxing um, um, do, uh, auditing and you know enforcement, but that's not anything RPA will, ad, will advise you to do. Um, but technically the rule is right now, if there's no video, you can't bill telehealth. Um, you, can only, uh, you can only use the, uh, the phone codes. So, um, Okay, so the next question is, can, can the newly approved telephone codes be used if the patient doesn't? Yes, the telephone codes means telephone, whereas telehealth means AV. So another question about, just to clarify, 90962, a single MCP visit is now payable. Yes, it is. That was added to the list on Monday. And again, the comprehensive visit, you know, uh, or complete assessment, there's no fine print in this that says that you can't do the complete assessment. It, it's not as if CMS put that in the rule that, all these services are covered by telehealth, but the complete assessment for ESRD visits can't be done. So there's no fine print that excludes that. So all of the e or all of the visits that you would do for your um, for your uh, for your dialysis patients are there. A question about using the GD GT modifier: you don't do that anymore, um, unless, of course, I, I can't remember what the GT situation is. If it's for a critical access hospital or for a um, um, or for asynchronous cost sharing, um, but um, but they uh, it, it, unless it's one of those rare situations, you're still going to want to uh, use the 95 modifier. So GT and GQ are the other, other modifiers, but those are relatively rare situations. Um, getting a, a question about can you share a link for some documentation? Again, I'd say go to the website and read the read the guidance. There are links to uh, a lot of the CMS documents there. Um, the question, can you address the PD regulations, face-to-face -face still required during the first three months of initiation as well as the regulation of first three months after? The face-to-face -face after the first three months does not have to happen anymore. And that was actually even included in the big stimulus package bill that Congress passed uh, last weekend and CMS implemented on Monday. The, the first three months of initiation, I'm virtually positive that's been waived too. I can't say definitely in the moment, but I believe that is the case. Um, can telehealth only be billed by the physician versus facility claim billing? Um, everything we're talking about here is Part B Medicare claims, so I'm not exactly sure what to say about, um, about facility billing. Um, moving on, do, 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 do. telephone only audio play, does it pay the same as televideo? The answer is no. Asking about documentation requirements for 99441 through 443, I would venture to say it attracts along the same lines as any E&M service you would do. So I would bill it that way. Um, hey, Rob, I'm seeing, know, it, of, sorry, I'm seeing a lot of questions about principal care management. So I thought I'd maybe jump in for a few minutes and let you start scrolling. No, that's perfect. Take it away, uh, Katie. Thank you. Sure. Um, oh, and where'd it go? Uh, so a couple of questions about principal care management. Um, it's true that it can only be billed by one practitioner and you don't want to step on your referral base. Um, because we were doing chronic care management, we actually reached out to our primary care docs in the community a couple of years ago to make sure that they were not going to uh, be adversely uh, affected or, or mad if we signed those up. Um, and the gener the buy-in was great from the primary care doctors. We said, look, we're only doing stage four and five. We're not interested in signing up stage three. Um, most primary care doctors find that stage four and five patients are a little bit complex and intimidating to them, and they're happy to have that extra layer of health. 
but it's a great question. And I do encourage you talking to your referral base uh, to make sure that they're okay. It's a big chunk of your clinic practice, but a pretty small chunk of theirs. So uh, I think that there is the capability in the room for everybody to do that. Certainly I would not be poaching if I had somebody who was a primary care doctor who was signing them up already and getting them established in their PCM program. I would not be trying to poach them. I think that's probably not how um, my colleagues would like to be treated. Um, so yeah, it's only one provider that can do it per month. Um, and it does require a uh, consent, but the consent can now be verbal initially. Uh, and then we mail, in addition to our care plans, we mail the written consent to the patient and they return it. Uh, so that takes care of the consent for principal care management. All right, Rob, that's what I've got for you right now on that. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, so um, some of the other questions um, there, uh, about retroactivity. Um, all of the changes from Monday are retroactive to March 1st. So if you're billing your MCP claims for March, um, you can do it under the, uh, under the new system. So you can do it via telehealth if you made that happen. Um, somebody asked about um, there's mixed information on audio only and they cite Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. You know, all of the advice we're talking about right now pertains to Medicare. Um, other payers might be doing different things, and I, I know that's a challenge to have to consult what they're doing, but I would just urge you to look at what, they, what their, um, uh, what, 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 you know, what their policies are. Um, does the comprehensive visit still require face-to-face? -face? As of Monday, definitively not. Um, can PD training 90989 be completed uh, using telehealth? Uh, for now, the answer is no. That is something that we're working on uh, with the Alliance for Home Dialysis. The administration knows about this issue and is hopefully going to be addressing it. Can visits two through four non-comprehensive be done just by telephone? The answer is no. Um, you know, I, I, Katie, I guess I'd ask your uh, opinion of this if you're still there. Um, oh, yeah. How do we document how do we document time on the telephone consult? I mean, do, have you done documentation for your telephone consults, and how does that work? Um, so I do, so I do not, um, build my note like a full, um, uh, encounter visit. Um, I pre-chart most of my notes. And so uh, since I have a clinic schedule, that's got those telehealth, those telephone only calls built into my schedule, I'll go in and pre-chart. Um, and then I have a little, uh, dot phrase they're called in Epic that the patient, um, was talked to on the telephone, um, that it was due to the COVID-19 emergency, that the patient was offered a full telehealth visit but did not have capability for real-time video, uh, and that the patient consented to the phone call encounter. Um, so my documentation, I usually just in real time as I'm talking to the patient, and this is where a Bluetooth headset is really helpful, is I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going through the encounter, um, I'm you know, reconciling their medications, I'm chatting with them, I'm talking about their labs. Um, and then at the end, I just put a little note about the time that I've spent and I include my, my pre-charting uh, and also the time on the telephone. Okay, thank you. So um, people are asking about the date of service update from O2 back to the original location. That's for all claims you submit to Medicare. It's not just for the dialysis or anything like that. That's Everything you're doing by telehealth from now moving forward until the public health emergency is over, use place of service O2 modifier 95. Um, again, all four visits um, must be done via telehealth, CN here, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to bill under telehealth. Again, it's the telephone questions or the telephone codes 441 to 443 are the only ones uh, where you can just use the phone. Um, PD visits but done by telehealth, yes, um, the PD codes were added to the approved list, so all of that can be done. Um, all of that can be done via um, uh, 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 telehealth. And boy, this is a great question. And Katie, I might ask you to weigh in on this if you happen to know. Do we need to use a modifier when billing the telephone co codes, and do we use place of service 11? I, first time I've ever thought about this, and I don't know the answer. I don't either, Rob. That's why I have you. <laughs> we'll get to the answer, uh, the person who asked this question. Um, uh, let's see. I, I, saw on, question, um, I saw a great question about a physical exam done versus on telehealth. So I'm happy to uh, talk about that. 
Um, if they've uh, got their vitals, I chart that the vitals were obtained at home using a home blood pressure monitor and what they are. Um, I have them hold the phone up to their face, right? So I can describe conjunctiva or non-injected, that the external nose and mouth are without lesions, um, that they appear either pale or well perfused, that they're either in or not in respiratory distress and their respiratory effort seems normal, that they're moving all their extremities quite well. I have them pan down to their ankles and press to assess for edema, um, that there's no obvious musculoskeletal deformities, uh, and that there's no rashes on visible skin, that their speech is fluent, they're alert and oriented, and their affect seems normal. Um, so I've lost track of how many, uh, how many different organ systems that is, but it winds up being quite a few. Okay, thank you. I uh, got a question about CPT codes 98966 to 68, and these are the telephone codes for, and I hate this phrase, but CMS uses it, non-physicians. So this would be your nurse practitioners and your physician assistants. So 98966 and 68 are the equivalent of 99441 to 43. So, um, but, but they are for the nurses and the MPs. And interestingly, they pay exactly the same as the physician codes do. So you can do that. Um, moving right along. There's a question about, you know, pointing out that rural locations rarely have the bandwidth to be able to do video. So right now, if you're going to bill your regular office codes, your levels one through five, Rob can reel off these numbers, but I can't. Um, it does have to be real time audio visual both ways. You can't do that over the phone. I think that that's an active area that RPA continues to, to advocate for, as well as a lot of the other medical societies. This is the digital divide. I'm in a rural location, and I'm really concerned that my patients don't have full access, um, plus the impact on rural practitioners. Um, but yes, as of right now, for those regular visits, those office visits, you do have to have real-time audio and visual. I've got a question that I've gotten from several people, not only in the question box, but I've gotten this on my on my uh, regular email. What about if you did two visits face to face and did two done via telehealth? Can we still bill 90960 using uh, the ESRD facility as a place of service and modifier 95? The answer is yes. You know, I I, I want to stress something, and I, and I want to be careful with the words I'm using here. A lot of the uh, questions we're getting, a lot of the concerns are about am I opening myself up to audit risk? And uh, CMS is not going to be splitting too many hairs, I don't think. So a question like this, you can absolutely still bill a 90960. Again, CMS used the phrase good faith in, their doc in all of their paper about auditing about 10 times. If you're trying to do the right thing, you probably shouldn't have um, um, any problems there. You know, um, uh, 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 Katie, do you know, does the patient have to initiate the telephone calls? So the guidance that we've seen is that the patient has to provide consent, but even if they're calling to check up on their appointment or we call to check with them, that that's enough for an initiation. So I place the calls. And I think that's going to have to, for me, and I know that can't be RPA's guidance, that's going to have to fall under good faith. And, and I think it will fall under good faith. Again, you know, I don't think CMS is going to be um, messing people over, to tell you the truth. I think they're trying to do the right thing here. So I'm scrolling down to try and find more questions. Will the slides be available? Yes, they absolutely will be. Um, Katie, there's a question. Have you used telemedicine for visits in the dialysis centers? Have you done that? Um, my unit is supposed to get up and running on that this month. So I have not done that yet, but that's on my to-do list for this week or next week. And that's going to be run through my LDO. So I am not doing my little uh, iPhone on a tripod thing for that. Um, the LDOs are rolling out their own telemedicine protocols. Um, and I believe ours is going to be worked through Microsoft Teams. Uh, <clears throat> and this is an issue that I think Katie discussed in, 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 her, uh, in her slides. but. A uh, question about chronic care management. If it's if it can only be done by one provider for a month, if the PCP is already do it, will the nephrologist also be able to do it? And the answer to that is no. CMS is going to only pay one 
Now, you can do the whole thing of racing to get your claim in, but I know a, nephro- a lot of nephrologists don't want to do that because they don't want to damage their referral base. So, um, yeah, uh, again, but, but would, the answer is? The answer is no, and it also, uh, it's not for ESRD patients. So there was a question in there about ESCO. So this is not a service that's oh, available right, for right. ESRD patients. Um, your stage fours and fives, I think you will find that many primary care doctors are going to be okay with you taking that on, especially your stage fives who are approaching the need for dialysis. There's a lot of coordination that needs to happen in terms of education, access, anemia, bone management. Uh, If you already have a good, strong um, relationship with your primary care doctors, I think they're gonna be quite welcoming to you doing this, Um, but it is a good idea to talk to them, absolutely. Yeah, and this is a related question to that, Katie. Does the principal care management still require written consent by the patient, and also doesn't this step on the primary care doc's toes? Yeah, so we're doing the written consent. You can do a phone consent initially, so my staff are documenting that, and then we mail them. You have to generate a written care plan for them. So when we're mailing that, plus our other educational materials, we also include the consent. And because we transitioned from chronic care management, which we've been doing since 2017, um, the primary care doctors in my area are really familiar with the fact that we do this. We also tend to back away for the month if there's a transitional care visit that they've done. That's a lot of work for them. And uh, we don't want them to lose out the work and the billing for that. So we'll skip doing a PCM visit that month or we just will do it and we won't bill for it. I, I think Katie already addressed this, but there's a question about the telephone only code state that the patient must generate a portal or email question. And, you know, and this falls under the good faith that she mentioned earlier. I think if, if you're making the phone call because you're trying to provide good care to your patient and make sure they're checked up on, I don't think an auditor is going to ding you 18 months from now because there, there wasn't a portal question leading up to it. Um, we're running, we're running into the where we got a lot of the same questions that are coming up right now. So, um, so Katie, there's a question about, can you speak to critical care telehealth? And I am not capable of that. I, I don't know if you have uh, knowledge of that. Um, not much yet. Um, right now, what we've okay. been doing for patients that are on Sorry our- to co- on the spot. <laughs> For, for folks that are on the COVID floors and in the intensive care unit uh, right now, um, we are uh, limiting the number of uh, visits that we go in um, and just kind of talking on the phone with our critical care colleagues. Um, so, you know, I do not feel like I need to go in and see somebody on dialysis every day. That means I'm not billing for it too, um, but whatever I can do to help my critical care colleagues, um, they're certainly the ones who are getting working really, really hard right now. I'm trying to preserve PPE. So um, they have not yet generated an iPad on a stick or something like that. It's just not been my focus. I don't feel like I need to maximize my billing in the hospital. I wanna make sure my patients get the care they need and support my colleagues. And there's gonna be a lot of stuff I don't bill for. Okay, um, there's a question about what about a telehealth consult in the hospital? I'm virtually positive those codes, <clears throat> excuse me, were added to the um, the, the approved list. But uh, go and check the RPA uh, the RPA guidance document because I dropped all of the codes that are I thought relevant to nephrology in there. Um, you know what? We're at 12:58. Des, uh, oh, oh, let me let me just make one more. We're about halfway through the questions we got asked. We literally were submitted about 166 questions, and through culling through similar questions, we got about th- through about half of them. I will take the rest of these questions, kind of uh, collate them, and generate answers, and we'll do what we can about getting that posted on the RPA website as soon as we can. I think we answered a lot. A lot of the questions were kind of the same question, though. So I, 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 I think we did get to a lot of these answers that were necessary. Um, Des, do you want to do you want to take over? Yes. Thank you, Rob. So this will conclude our webinar for today. I want to thank everyone for participating. Um, it has been great. Dr. Kwan, Rob, thank you so much for sharing valuable information. And just like Rob said, we will have the questions in our COVID-19 hub, they'll have an opportunity to go through them. 
and we'll make sure that we answer as many of them as we can. I noticed some we're still putting questions in the chat. We'll do our best to try to grab those as well and include those in our Q&A. So again, we'd like to hey, thank Des, our, yes. Des, Des, can I interrupt real quick? I'm sorry sure. to be so rude. Um, th the question came up, do you have to be an RPA member to, to look at the hub? And the answer is no, that's, that's public access. So all of this stuff is available to everybody. Although you should be an RPA member because we're working so hard for you folks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and the, yes, this is right on the homepage. So if you go to uh, renalmd.org, it's right on our homepage. Just click on it and all of that information will be there. This webinar was recorded. And so this will also be uploaded there as well. So you'll have a chance to go back and look at it. And without uh, further ado, I want to thank everyone again. Mm -hmm. And also thank you so much for being on the front lines. For those of you who are members, thank you so much for your support of the organization. We are here for you and we're doing our best to serve you the best way we can. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. Thank you, Rob Blazer. And I hope everyone has a great day.